Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bifear. After the calamitous battle that would forever be known as the Great Disaster, the surviving Guardians would return to Earth to lick their wounds. Some had lost more than others. Ariana III, most of all. In our last episode on Crota's End and its lore, we discussed how Ariana III lost the Titan that was her lover in the Great Disaster, the Great Titan Wei Ning. The exact moment when Ariana decided to swear vengeance against Crota, the son of Oryx, for the murder of her lover, was unknown. It could have been in a moment of quiet agony, private and unknown to the rest of the world. It could have been as she fled the Battle of Mare Ibrium with the other defeated Guardians. It might have been loud and decisively declared to her fellow Lightbearers. Regardless of when and where and how Ariana swore vengeance, one thing was made abundantly clear. She would not be receiving any aid from the Vanguard. The establishment of a Lunar Interdiction Zone and the declaration by the Consensus that there would be no official support for Guardian operations in cislunar space meant one simple fact. There would be no second avenging army to aid Ariana. She was going to have to do all of this on her own. Or at least, she was going to need to find help elsewhere. So begins the second act of her tragedy. So begins the tale of the first fire team to pursue Crota into the dark below. And it all began with the need to seek out a man whose words and teachings earned him the title of The Shattered. With the Vanguard's resources no longer being made available to any Guardians, let alone Ariana III, her options for revenge were cut very thin. There was no shortage of courage in the tower. Perhaps it was not a lack of courage, but a lack of hope, which was draining the will of the Guardians to join Ariana. Needless to say, there would be few who would join her in the end, but from amongst the crowd, a stern huntress would step forward. Her beliefs were well aligned to those of Ariana III. She too sought vengeance and justice for those that had fallen on the field of battle at Mare Ibrium and the Ocean of Storms. Her decision to assist Ariana III would be the most profound choice that she would ever make and would change the shape of her destiny forever. Her name is well known to you. The hunter was none other than Eris Morn. Together, the two guardians began to look for ways to gather support against the son of Oryx. They knew that one of the major failings of the Consensus's attempt to retake Luna was their lack of actionable or credible intelligence on the enemy. Some of the most crucial hive intelligence that had been gathered that day was in fact gathered by Ariana herself in the field. Her torture of a hive wizard would lead her to the discovery of what she would later confirm, that Crota, the monstrous ascendant hive at the head of the swarm, could not be killed in our reality. His physical form would need to be destroyed, yes, but in order to truly kill Crota, he would need to be destroyed within his own pocket cyst in reality, his throne world, or nether world, as they referred to it. Within this ascendant realm, Crota could be found, and if he was to fall there, at the heart of his power, he would die for good. Ariana and Eris had acquired this crucial piece of information, but despite its significance, this information alone clearly wasn't enough. And so, Eris and Ariana went seeking knowledge via one of the few avenues left to them. A clandestine one. If the Vanguard would not assist them, they would find someone who would. They set their sights on an exiled warlock whose obsession with Hive Apocrypha was known to run deep. Too deep. Many believed that he had been warped and twisted by such dark arcana and that he had succumbed to its madness. Thus, he had earned his title, Toland, the Shattered. It should be stated just how crucial a step this was for Ariana III. It's clear from this that she was desperate, but I don't think it's ever been discussed how desperate it shows that she truly was in this moment, because I don't think that anyone has ever linked her action of going to Toland with the order that she was a part of. The Praxic Order of Warlocks is a strange and somewhat misguided beast. I personally considered myself philosophically aligned to their ideals, 
And in the days when Destiny's morality was much more black and white and much more cookie cutter, that morality made sense. Praxic warlocks are a strange bunch even by the standard of warlocks because of one of their key tenets, which is that we should worry less about the nature of the darkness and should concern ourselves with its defeat. If a warlock is given the option of studying the enemy or destroying them outright, normally the warlock will choose to glean knowledge first and then go for the kill. Not so with the practics. They prefer not to be bogged down in dogma and prefer to simply kill, understanding that the defeat of the darkness is truly more important and understanding that darkness itself is dangerous. This belief is better exemplified by their rather inquisitional reputation. Warlocks within the Order are known to be fierce warriors, but they are more importantly concerned with hunting down and containing artifacts of darkness to prevent them from falling into the hands of their fellow guardians. This is done in order to prevent corruption. They are one of the most ancient warlock orders who existed before the last city had even raised its first walls, according to Arnor. Their reputation as incorruptible is often reinforced in this modern era by some of their most notorious guardians, including Arnor Mahal, one of the right hands in the hidden to Ikora Ray, who personally has executed an unknown number of guardians. All of these guardians were supposedly corrupted by darkness to the point where they were irrecoverable and too dangerous to be left alive. This is a common justification for a praxic inquisition of this nature. Whilst some combatants are returned to the tower and brought back to the light, Arnor in particular is known to be fairly ruthless, and she has very few qualms about murdering a guardian who decides not to take the one chance they're given. The Praxic Order has also been known to pursue objectives rather doggedly. They've petitioned the Vanguard for permission to apprehend the Drifter, viewing him as a greater threat to the last city than even Dominus Gaul or Oryx the Taken King. Their concern is not so much with the darkness itself in this particular respect, but with how easily it can corrupt those who fight it. When Gaul arrived in the system, he had no concern for darkness, only for claiming the light. His threat was one to the city, but not to the soul of Guardians. When Oryx arrived, he wished to kill us as vengeance for his son. But the Drifter represents an existential threat of corruption, one which the Praxix considered to be even more dangerous than even the Taken King himself. The most accomplished Guardians within the Praxic Order are honored with the Cormorant Seal. Arnor is one such honored Praxic. And so was Ariana III. And so you have to realize all of this as you think about Ariana. She is a Praxic warlock honored with the Cormorant Seal, and in her desire to see vengeance done, she was seeking out Toland the Shattered, an exiled warlock who was called Mad, and who had been exiled specifically because of his studies of Dark Hive magic. On any other day of the week, if Ariana found him, it was likely the case that she would try to apprehend him and arrest him so that he could be either killed or brought back to the tower to be re-educated and forced back into the ways of the light and obedience to the Traveler. These two are enemies. They are not friends. But Ariana was willing to push her entire creed to the side so that she could see her vengeance done. This all shows just how far Ariana was willing to go to avenge Wei Ning. None of it mattered anymore. The only thing that mattered to her was vengeance. The summary of Eris and Ariana's meeting with Toland was made in the Grimoire card for the Crota's End raid back in Destiny 1. It reads as follows. My name is Ariana III. Disciple of the Praxic Warlocks, marked by the Cormorant Seal, survivor of the Great Disaster. The day we set out to retake our moon united in a host of thousands, and found ourselves outmatched by one Hive Champion of unspeakable power. The monster's name is Crota. He killed my friends face to face, one by one, and he relished it. In the name of all those I lost, I devote myself to his utter destruction. This is my confession. 
If I transgress in your eyes, I ask for your forgiveness. In our world, Crota seemed invincible. Together, Eris Morn and I worked the problem, but found no hope. We sought forbidden knowledge. The exiled master of Hive Arcana. We found Toland. Toland tells us that Crota's presence in our world is a shadow. That its true power resides in another world forged by his will. We must pass through a keyhole between realities, navigate the seething midnight of Crota's world mind, and overthrow the ascendant champions that gather to his throne. Toland speaks, he hardly seems mad at times, of the terrible things that await us. A secret song he hungers to learn, and the issue of that song, an ashen, burning star husk that looms above, the utter antithesis of life. He talks of it with a curious ambition I do not want to understand. Tomorrow I will ask Agar, Mota, and Talo if they will go with us. If we fail, I leave this record for guardians to come. Remember us. Ariana broke her creed to find her vengeance, but at least with Toland's application of knowledge, they now had a plan of action, desperate as it was. It was still not clear at the time what Toland was truly searching for. His curious ambition, as Ariana would call it, would only reveal itself later, as the Hour of Doom approached and as the fire team descended into the Hellmouth. Suffice to say that Toland did not join the mission to conquer Crota's nether realm out of a desire for vengeance. He is known to have said that he appreciated the directness of Wei Ning and that he admired her courage, but a reprisal for the revered lost would not be what moved the exile that day. His true agenda would be one of his own making and would be based in his desire to seek an understanding of the Hive's death song. He perhaps knew what lurked down in the dark below, and he knew that this fire team was his best chance to obtain it. Even if this was made more explicit at the outset, though, I doubt it would have changed the outcome. Toland would join the fire team because he was the only one who knew of the hive and their terrible power, and so he had to be recruited. In the lore note I just gave, Ariana also names her other companions that would eventually join her in the mission to defeat Crota. The hunters Omar Agar and Sai Mota, and the titan Veltalo. These heroes would join this desperate crusade, and they would walk its path to their unfortunate doom. These other heroes and the union of the fire team in a single purpose is what we'll be talking about next time as we cover the first Crota fire team. But that's all from me for now. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, go ahead and leave a like, and of course, leave your own thoughts down below in the comments section. If you want to keep up to date with Destiny's story and with the lore from the Season of the Witch, you can go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. But as per usual, know that your viewership as always is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Rodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.